everyone and welcome to the launch of Ink and Insight. This is an inaugural partnership between the Poetry Society of Jamaica and UNESCO. And today we are commemorating, among, you know, alongside several other bodies and stakeholders around the world, we are celebrating Media and Information Literacy Week. And today we're going to gather established and emerging um, leaders in the poetry and wider literary community in Jamaica to explore the role of poetry in media and in information literacy and in the dynamics of these different fields and how they continue to shape and impact our world. We trust that this will be the first of several conversations that we'll be having because this is not going to be a one-stop shop. As, as things evolve and as things change, we want to make sure that we remain on the cutting edge of what's happening and that we show the increasing relevance of poetry, of art, in the world that we're living in and shaping today. I have the pleasure and honor of sharing this time with a very distinguished panel. You're gonna hear from each one of these persons today. We have Carlin Thompson, she's a media and, literacy, media and information literacy expert at Micro University. We have Javanil J. Talawa Trowers, who is an entrepreneur and a budding poet and an already and very active member of the Poetry Society of Jamaica's planning committee. We have Dr. Amina Blackwood Meeks, who is an internationally acclaimed storyteller with a PhD in cultural studies. And we have Malachi Smith, who is one of the founding members of the Poetry Society of Jamaica and is in Jamaica right now for the annual Nomadic Poet School and College Tour that he has been conducting since 2017. So I'm going to hand over right now to Carlin Thompson. I'm going to ask you, Carlin, can you give us an overview of what exactly is media and information literacy? What is it and why is it important? And why should we all take the time to not just talk about it, but pay attention to it in this day and age, especially with the rise of, you know, digital, you know, especially with the rise of digital trends in media? Good afternoon, everybody. It is a very important week. And I'd just like to say, we have to become more aware. The world is changing. Mm -hmm. You have AI, you have all this information, we have all this access to information, and it's changing our lives. What media and information literacy does is it gives us the skills, the competencies to decide, is this information correct? Is it relevant? Are there other perspectives? Why are we being given this information? Because right now, every single thought, every single thing that we're exposed to affects us. So that is what media and information literacy does. It gives us the skills to think. Let me give you an example. We only use 10% of our brains. Everybody knows that? Mm -hmm. okay. Yes, you're not in? Yeah, yeah. That information is incorrect. That has been debunked <laughs> over and over and over, and people still see it. We hear it in movies, we hear it in songs, and it has become such a part of our conversation. Oh, we use only 10% of our brains, therefore, if we just tried, we would be able to control the world because humans are so powerful, and we are. Mm -hmm but it's not true. We are not using only 10% of our brains. And we have seen so many movies that have pushed that. When you have media and information literacy, you have to think about certain things. And I have added, I have a list. You have to be taught. You have to be taught when you're engaging with anything at all, every song, every advertisement, everything. You have to be taught how to analyze this material. Additionally, you need time. So what happens is that we go on social media, we hear something, we just watch it one time, and then we just run with it. But it, it takes time. We have to think, why would this person say that? Why are they doing this? What is the motive behind all of this? After time, we need tenacity. We have to be, de be determined to want the truth or the different perspectives because everything is not as it seems and we know this and it's affecting even our children our girls in particular and our boys to some extent where they see things 
and they believe is the truth. So we need tenacity. We have to, as a global society, as a global community, decide that we are going to get the most accurate information that we can get. Finally, we need technology and resources. Mm -hmm. In the schools, in our homes, in the society, we have to be able to get children to understand how to analyze and create these different types of media. So they need to be exposed. We can't tell them, oh, you know, we need to be able to understand movies and songs if we're not using them in the classroom, in the homes. I'm going to, does anybody, is there a point where you can remember where your parents sat with you and discussed a movie, discussed a song, discussed an advertisement? Exactly. And because for the life of me, every cleaning agent ad that I've watched, why are the women alone are clean? Why? And it affects us because I remember from a child growing up all these years, that's all I've seen. Every cleaning, every laundry ad. Why is it the only the woman? Media literacy you know, is going to say, why am I being presented with this? Why? Is this normal? Is this, is it how, am I being fed a narrative that I'm supposed to believe in? And that's what media and information literacy does. It empowers you to not only read the, wor the word, but read the world. That's my two cents. I love that. And you've started off on such a powerful note. Thank you for giving us those nuggets to think about needing time, the tenacity to pursue truth, and how we engage technology. I'm wondering, Talawa, <laughs> since we're on the tease, <laughs> Talawa, do you want to jump in and talk about how, um, as not just as a poet, but I know that you are an entrepreneur in the creative space. How you see, yeah, how do, how do you, how would you unpack that in your own walk? Hmm. You know, so what, what Carlin, Carlin was saying a while ago. It's a great point. Uh, for me, I would say that when you are not only, not only as an entrepreneur, but just in general as a member of society, when you're using social media, you have to always think about branding. How do you want to portray yourself? What values you um, want to showcase to the world? So it is your, every every brand, every company, every organization has to ask itself, what story, what front-facing uh, message is it um, giving to the world? And to me, this poetry, what this, as a, everyone has a different way of approaching it, but this poetry, what it is to me, it's supposed to be a way of um, transforming the human experience. It's supposed to be unveiling truth in such a way that we are, we ask, we stop and ask the questions that make us ponder, wait, is this the way how things should be or is this the way things are? I'll never forget, um, name is slipping me at the moment, um, what, there was an event uh, that we had at, uh, there's an event, there's a poetry event that happened recently, and there's a storyteller who performed a very provocative piece where she talked about relationships like between men and women, and she described all the positives and the negatives and of that can happen between it, and it gave me pause to, to, to just see like. We currently are bombarded with so many different ideas about what um, like a man or a woman should be in relationships. And this poem short um, definitely had me question what why is why is this the message? why why is this the way things are? And are we conscious about how we move throughout with the people that we consider love, lovers? Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> very well thought of. Um, since we're on a line of poetry and just how that's helping to shape or at least challenge us to question how we view things that are as, how do you say, fundamental to the human experience as 
man o man man o man things, <laughs> right? Um, Malachi, do you want to jump in? Um, is there anything that you want to jump in and say? Yes, and and more than Jay Tala was wanted to say piggyback on on what Carlin said earlier, because I, as a poet, say in this time where you have you've been bombarded with with all kind of stimuli from all over the place. Um, when, when you when you o- even open your phone, and and you realize the type of information that's coming from all about, and not only that, the 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 things that are deliberately targeted at us. When I say us, I mean black peoples and minorities all over the globe. People tend to be to be packaging things and just throwing it down, and we're just gobbling it up. You know, we have forgotten that we need to use a holistic perspective, then do your analysis and find the truth. And and that's where I believe that, that the poets and the artists has such an important role to play in our society amongst our people in this time. Because I'd say many of us have gone astray because of all of these bombardment with all these stimuli from all over the place. And we tend to, to jump in them. I remember having a conversation um, it it was prior to one of the, the recent elections in the States and I was doing my radio program and I walk inside here and a RAS that I have enormous respect for and he was showing me this, this, this poster of this so-called candidate who could even put the party that he was running for because he wanted to mask himself, chameleon. And he was bored about so much support this morning you know, because dollars are going to run. And I said, you want a man to take off your locks and whip you. Right? Mm-hmm. That's the rule of the poet. Wow. Right mm-hmm. there. So, so the poet has, has to be sharp in this time to mm-hmm. educate. Because if our people can't analyze for themselves, then we have to be the channel that is opening up their eyes to reality. Oh, wow. 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 Yes. Oh, yeah. Thank you for that. Dr. Dr. Blackwood <laughs> Meeks. Wow. <laughs> Present me. <laughs> <laughs> Teacher, <laughs> ring the bell. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to jump in, um, especially after that powerful and convicting note that Malachi left us on? It's a very provoking subject that we are here discussing on many levels. Media and information literacy do not exist in isolation from cultural literacy, Mm -hmm. from social literacy, Mm -hmm. from political literacy. How do we understand ourselves and how do we use the technology to transmit um, that understanding Second thing I want to say is we, we sit around this table and we talk about we, and perhaps we represent the two or seven percent of the population. Mm. There is a statistics that says two of the two percent of the world's people are educated to the tertiary level. Mm-hmm. And because Jamaica likes to defy everything, we're seven percent. And, and and what that means is we represent a point of view mm-hmm. that the rest of the population does not have access to. So they might not even be able to understand when we talk about needing to convince, convince them of something because their values, their experiences are different from ours. And sometimes we are the minority and mm-hmm. we are a sad minority. The Russians have a phrase that when translated into English means the pain of knowing. Mm. Mm. So because you're a minority does not mean that you are wrong. Mm -hmm. It very often means you're right. But how do we convince other people of this rightness when their experiences of being marginalized, of being desmodified, mm. do not inform them of the correctness of what we're saying. Mm. So literacy is not just in words, it is in the images and the symbols. All of us grow up knowing, no matter how poor you are, that we have different kind of clothes. 
We have yard clothes and house clothes. Yeah. We have school clothes and church clothes. We have going out clothes and good clothes. And all of a sudden it appears that we do not know anymore that when you wake up out of your bed and somebody knocks at your door, the clothes that you sleep in is not the clothes that you go to the door to answer. <laughs> It sounds like a trite thing, mm -hmm. but what we have lost in this is a concept of what is appropriate. What is appropriate. So we don't know what's appropriate in dress. Mm -hmm. We don't know what's appropriate in behavior. We don't know what's appropriate in relationships, whether it's man or woman or with granny or with grandfather, because we are exposed to the sorrows of other people's kitchen where them don't respect them granny. Mm -hmm. And the United States grapples with a problem called granny dumping, where they take their grandparents to the border and leave them there and hope that somebody will pick them up like a stray animal. But that that is not our cultural reality. Mm -hmm. That's not our heritage. Mm -hmm. So the next thing is that when we talk about cultural literacy, we have to be aware that there is something called social engineering. Mm -hmm. What are we being engineered away from? Mm -hmm. And what are we being engineered into? Mm -hmm. And how do we stand up and say, hell no, mm -hmm. that's not who I am. I was raised differently. I come from a long line of royalty and this is how royalty behave. I come from a long line of respecting the people who are older than me. You know, I go to South Africa and people two years older than me, if them is so much older than me, bow when them see me and give me the dumaleng because that is how you relate mm -hmm. to people who are older than yourselves and we seem to have lost that we were engineered in a particular way, that we give the world everything it has that is useful and appropriate. This microphone, this computer, this chair, this beautiful way of dressing, we give it to the world and we surrender it to the negative images of the West because the West has many positive images that we don't get. And we have to ask ourselves why we have people who are called social influencers mm -hmm. and they dominate uh, the media, social media, and them never hear about Miss Lou or Olive Lewin. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And them yeah. don't know that Marcus Garvey was an entrepreneur. And them going to line up for other people's fast food. And as we consume their fast food, we consume their culture. And then believe it is okay to skip down the down the road with the symbol of this consumption, a red and white box. A red We Angla say that we want to see them line up at the jerk chicken man are the coconut jelly man mm -hmm. as media literacy mm -hmm. so that we use the media to not just remember ourselves and when i say remember i mean on two levels i mean the intellectual capacity to remember but i also mean the ability to find our scattered parts of course mm -hmm. and bring them back together as one whole mm -hmm. so so for me the whole business of media literacy is so tied up to the complexities of social and economic and political marginalization and of desmodifying the vast majority of the black African population in this part of the world that a lot of work needs to go on before we expect people who have been failed by the education system to be able to ask questions like, now why are they showing me this thing? And what other perspective should I view it from? When the only perspective we know as CNN mm -hmm. and they tell us where to direct our gaze. So now they tell us to direct our gaze to the very important situation of Palestine. But they don't tell us to direct our gaze to Burkina Faso and Gabon. Mm -hmm. 
and Sudan. Mm -hmm. And many of us would never have heard those words. So we in this room mm -hmm. need the, the, the writers, the, the poets, the dancers, the singers need to direct ourselves to using our art forms to the business of cultural education. And I don't mean the ability to read and write alone mm -hmm. cultural education so that when we say they should be able to question these values we know that we have created the basis on which they are able to do so mm. wow pure mm. fire <laughs> pure <laughs> fire there, that was, this discussion is already so rich i think yeah. what i'm hearing just from all of us is the need to take it on two different levels so we we are we're all we're all consuming media whether or not we want to admit it again i think as malachi said the moment you open your phone you're being bombarded by it so on an individual level, we have to be, you know, examining ourselves, assessing ourselves. What are we consuming? Why do we find ourselves going back to these same sources? What, how is it, you know, what, what are the messages being relayed there? And then on another level, what is on a global level, you know, even across the diaspora, like, you know, why, why are certain messages being put to certain races of people? Like the black, like, you know, why are, you know, why are black consumers of media being given these messages all the time? And then um, Dr. Blackwood Meeks just, you know, opened up this door of the whole idea of artvocacy, as I like to call it, using art to advocate for different, for the, for the right kind of messages that we want to see in our societies that will defend and dignify the cultures that we've grown up in and how we want those cultural values to not fade away, you know, but to be, to be responsible as being repositories of, you know, or values or culture or heritage. Um, Carolyn, is there anything you want to jump in and say? You look like you're, you're <laughs> like uh, there's fire in your no, bones right now. <laughs> no, not really, you know, it's just that it's very important. What, what, um, what she said was, was so powerful. I just needed a minute Sell. because yeah, yeah, I Sell just needed, I, yeah, I just needed a minute because the truth is we need a formal education system that supports the critical analysis of everything that's the first thing that we need and the the curriculum that we have now it really does have the space it has the ideas for this kind of growth but what we need is a national understanding of where we want to go because right now we have a curriculum that's very powerful, very detailed, does push critical thinking, but we need a general understanding so that everybody can put their energies into it. And what I mean is we need the budget. We need the teachers to buy into the vision. We need the children and the parents to buy into the vision because without that, it doesn't make any sense. Because how are we, as you rightly said, how are we going to tell people to analyze material if they don't have the prerequisite skills to analyze material. And that is the truth. If, if my most important thing coming out of primary school is, do God please make me pass for this school. Mm. And high school is, do make me please get seven ones. Mm. My journey as a student should be empathy understanding different perspectives so i get i get the feeling that as a country we are not on the same page where our goal is to meet these very superficial benchmarks and not to grow as a people as a collective community yeah. you know what i'm saying it's not it's just about passing let us do well academically let us let us win on the tracks and all of that but what about how we develop and create ourselves and look at the things and say, listen, mm -hmm. this is working for us, right? We can't be running down fast food. You know, when we have mangoes and we have sweet soap and we can't be doing that. Right. And then, you know, I, I, oh, give an example. I was in a small market and I, there's some teenage girls were, I was there. So there's a particular local brand that I like. And it's, it's, it's hot chocolate. So I'm sure you know the brand. There's a brand that everybody buys them, say cheap. But to me, it's delicious. Mm. And it's a local brand. So there was an American brand on the shelf. So there are these teenage girls beside me. So 
this this girl she went up and she took one of the lo- the local ones and her friends started laughing they're like my girl you know Atta, what you do with that and they were making fun of her and so i took up the same brand the same local brand and i said do you know that they use local products to make this do you look and i said to them let us read it together look at look at the ingredients in this one as opposed to this one on the american brand there were some items that we didn't know what they were mm. and i said ladies how can you laugh at something that was produced by your country mm-hmm. and when you read the ingredients you can actually you actually know those ingredients you're looking at this american but you know nothing we don't know what these things are these are the kinds of conversations that we need as a nation as a global society and that is what is needed may, may i say something about the curriculum that's that's very important. The curriculum is something on paper. Mm-hmm. The curriculum mm-hmm. don't have any meaning except the teacher who interprets it. Mm-hmm. Many of the teachers in our classroom are suffering from the same pathology mm-hmm. of believing that our history began when Columbus got lost on our shores. Mm-hmm. And that, and that we didn't create pyramids and all of these things. They go into the classroom against that background. They go into the classroom not wanting to hear the name Marcus Garvey. Sure. So when the curriculum says, discuss who is a statesman, they will not reach for the name of Marcus Garvey as a statesman. Now here is what I think um, can appropriately demonstrate the pathology. In 2012, when Jamaica was on the verge of turning 40. Stone Pole Organization did a poll as to how Jamaicans felt about being independent. I get into big trouble Mm -hmm. because the morning the poll was published, I called the Gleaner and I said, surely you've made a mistake. You have recorded the poll as saying 53% of Jamaicans believe they would have been better off under Britain. Surely it was 35. And, <laughs> and I made the mistake of identifying myself. So when the gleaner was laughing, them know who them was laughing at. Mm-hmm. Because it was in fact 53% don't laugh. Ten years later, Bill Johnson repeated the poll on the eve of Jamaica becoming 50. Can I tell you, the mark went up by 6%. It was now 60% of Jamaicans who say we would have been better off under the queen skirt tail. Now, if a generation of students is five years, we lost four generations in those 10 years. We lost the two generations who passed through primary school and we lost the two generations who passed through secondary school. Now, here is the sad thing. Enough of them were teachers college and end up a teach with children say it would be better off Mm -hmm. and don't know that they can say Marcus Garvey as statesman and none of them would have out there a line up for taste a particular kind of donut I might come to school and ask them 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 children if them did taste it now what we know is that there is something called the hidden curriculum it's what does not happen in the classroom but it is what happens the minute you step through the gate before the bell rings. And when the bell rings, we see teachers who don't love their complexion. We see them in one color skin last week. And when we turn up this week, we cannot recognize them. We cannot put last seen as. And that's the hidden curriculum. So, so it is very different from what is there on paper as the national standards curriculum. Because who is delivering the national standards curriculum is very often standing in opposition mm-hmm. to what it is that we want our people to evolve as. So now we're talking about turning republic. Mm-hmm. We're talking about turning republic, you know. And we're talking about doing a referendum, mm-hmm. 
on the question of republic. When I was a baby, I clearly remember being being sat on my father's shoulders. Remember them used to put you on their shoulder <laughs> so you can't see over the crowd. I clearly remember my parents downtown and me sitting on them shoulder and people I say, um, independence, yes, federation, no. <laughs> we didn't want a Caribbean federation. We never want to come together as one. No wonder Sparrow said, go outside, man, go outside. Oh, you mean you don't want federation no more? And we have lived to see that kind of disunity spread across the region when, guess what? The EU, the EU, take up the blueprint. Take up the blueprint <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> for Caribbean Federation and now I show off and we say them have yeah. European Union. Mm -hmm. So what is the hidden curriculum in schools, in ourselves, in the way we deliver ourselves? What is the hidden curriculum of the church? The hidden mm -hmm. curriculum of the politicians? Mm -hmm. Because our children spend five hours a day in front of a teacher who may or may not sway them to a certain way of thinking. And then their parents carry them to the political meeting, campaign time, mm -hmm. and them here where mm -hmm. this one I say, and I cuss off that one. And so the disunity and the mm -hmm. dislike of mm -hmm. one another. And, and then we could extrapolate this in all kinds of directions. Yes, yes. And so what, what the, the big conundrum we face is, in the face of these um, divisions and manifestations of the historical um, pathology, mm -hmm. what is the mechanism by which we try to arrive at a national consensus about mm -hmm. where we want to go yeah. and whether we that is seen? I, I, would, I would like to jump in. Okay, be jump, uh, yeah, because because um, what, what Amina is saying is so profound and the whole discussion and uh, and so we have the teachers teaching for five hours per day and then the 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 media right in all farms mm -hmm. teaching again mm -hmm. for most kids mm -hmm. when they're supposed to be sleeping including teenagers mm -hmm. to adolescents them up doing all kind of things mm -hmm. and the gadgets and so they have been bombarded with with that constantly the balance to me the balancing act was when you had a Pablo Moses who say, for we should be in Angola. Or uh, we said, a Bob Marley say, Africa unite. Or uh, when we have a Peter to said, equal rights and justice, I mean it. Right? And you see how in this time, if, if the, the media, if, if the media is being true to itself and we have a responsibility and obligation as practitioners, you as teacher, you as a teacher, to as an influencer in the society in, in real time, to utilize the arts to kind of shift the paradigm and become an influencer. And in when you listen to a, a Peter Touch, Equal Rights and Justice, my God, no, right now in the world. Right? Everybody was talking at the UN today or whatever they were. There. All they had to do was go up there, just, just read the words of Peter Tuss, equal rights. You don't have to say a word. Mm. You don't have to say a word. It is so potent, so poignant to what is, is happening. And, and that's why I believe that, that the, the poets, the songwriters, we are the conscience of the society. And so we have to find a way, right? We have a responsibility, an obligation again to take on the king's court, to take on the politicians, right? To take on the students, to educate and elevate the narrative so people realize what these influences are doing, this social engineering and all these other things that everybody's dumping in our headspace to our detriment. And we have to, we have to liberate ourselves from the slavery, because mm -hmm. none but ourselves can what? Free our minds. Okay. And and I just want to jump into because 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 now I'm thinking about because there's 
um, you mentioned technology, and mm -hmm. as someone of the younger generation, I'm actively learning how to use technology to to spread my message or the message mm -hmm. and to to pass on your your torches that you guys will leave for us. And how can I now use my poetry in service of uh, elevating consciousness? And the thing is, there's there's always will be this one thing that comes to mind is because now we're in a new age right this digital age is we are we are in a two-way conversation through social media we have people that can reach out to us through the media and we can reach out to them we can have any person can now have a be an influencer have a live audience and capture mm -hmm. and that not only shapes what we say but it shapes it shapes the very interactions that are formed um by their very nature, we hear the word parasocial relationship. A lot of people are looking to um, their 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 superstars are Logan Paul and Drakes and anyone that is um, now who has managed to leverage social media in such a way that it is uh, that they get views and attention. And the currency now isn't um, who is saying the best or the smartest things. It's the it's who can get the clicks, who can. Um, raise um, attention on the eyeballs so it's like the, the, the responsibility of our programmers our developers why aren't we moving uh, how can we move these algorithms or these or maybe it's a case of how of we need to ask ourselves as consumers of media why are we clicking on the things we're clicking on do is it that we have to have this catchy clickbait title to get you to engage with something that would actually shift your mind? We have very short attention spans and we have left behind the lessons of COVID in the so-called post-COVID era. Come in and know who them post it to and if it has been delivered. <laughs> 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 but I hadn't thought of that before. Yes. But one of the lessons of COVID was the importance of the up close and personal relationships. Mm -hmm. We are locked in mm -hmm. with our grandparents, with our bigger mm -hmm. sisters and brothers, our mothers and fathers. What do we talk about? Mm -hmm. What were the important lessons? We used to sit down and have our birthday parties and Christmas dinners on Zoom because understanding the next person's heart mm -hmm. was so important mm -hmm. who we know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And COVID finish, mm -hmm. and we go back, go and click on the flowers. Mm -hmm. The flowers say, "I'd like to be your friend." Mm -hmm. And we click on the flowers, and we don't know if the flowers is pies and ivy, <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> or any of those things. We click click on the flowers, and I tell the flowers all of our deepest heart, mm -hmm. and our mothers and fathers are still there, but we have discontinued the conversation. And so there is so much of it that is in our hands to correct. This conversation has been absolutely rich and moving and convicting. There are so many points that have come up. Um, I love the, the concept of the hidden curriculum. I don't think I'm, I, I can't get over that because you're absolutely right. And that hidden curriculum is the foundation on which every other curriculum is going to be built. So... As poets, we really, as poets, as storytellers, we need to see ourselves as playing a role even in this hidden curriculum and how that hidden curriculum um, paves the way for how we even receive information. You know, what we see as a veritable source, what we see as a kind of influence that we want to have on us. Because even though we're being bombarded by information, we are still have agency in what we allow to influence us, right? And so as poets, um, I want us to really see ourselves in that light as as contributors to hidden curriculums in a positive way, in a way that can lead to positive social engineering because social engineering is happening whether or not we're a part of it. So we need to insert ourselves in this way, in a way that will lead to the transformation of our societies that will be better for generations to come so that we can drop that percentage by 6% each time when it comes to you know Jamaicans who would want to be in Jamaica and not just be colonized again. That's the kind of way that I'd want us as poets to be approaching this. So as we're wrapping this up, I was wondering if each of you could think of something um, that you'd want to leave with, you know, honestly, it doesn't even have to be with fellow poets, with 
poetry aficionados, with art lovers, with anybody who understands the importance of media and information literacy, especially after listening to this program. In 30 seconds or so, um, let's start with Carlin and we'll go around. <laughs> Hush, Carlin, well, you need more time to process. <laughs> no, no, I'm, I'm good. What I want to leave with everybody is that we need to find a way to not only balance, but make, the, make it uneven. So we, yes, we are, we are going to have these very superficial messages, but as uh, artists, poets, whatever it is, we need to be pushing the higher order things that make us more empowered and stronger. So we need to hear more voices of the, in the arts where we're learning all of these lessons. Wonderful. All right, Malachi? And I believe the way the lessons are to be taught, one of the weakness that, that many of us have is that we get too dogmatic mm -hmm. and we tend to be if you're not listening to me or that y you're not on my side you're not on my page and tend to scare off people i i believe in being the facilitator who should open up the the discussion right mm -hmm. create the marketplace of idea mm -hmm. so i can listen to a, a, a dr amina mix and i can listen i can learn from her and I can say, you know, but you know something, I am thinking that there I would do this, I would do that. I rock Harlan, and I can bring a different perspective. And that and that's what I want to see us doing as as the conscience of society, as the poets, as the artists, is to take up the the mantle of taking the, the dialogue that will be influencing how our, our people think what they're watching on social media, what they're getting from it, right? By us giving them this base, this conscience. Wonderful. Wow. Dr. Black and Meeks. Um, I, th I think part of it is how we represent ourselves. And if we look around the room, we see how beautifully and naturally we're represented. I want to read half of a poem yes. from my uh, COVID pandemic collection. And this one is called Case Against Poverty. Suppose we wake up tomorrow, not just open our eyes and yawn, but jump up with a startle, burst out in cold sweat, temperature rising, heart racing, throat dry, nose running, eyes misty. Wake up with a diagnosis of hatred for poverty, with a COVID-19 measurement on the hatred panic ferrometer. Would we hate it enough to find a cure? Fear it enough to release the cure, even if it had not been tested and found safe for human consumption, but with the confidence that we had been working on it since Paul Bogle, Sam Sharp. Would we? Could we? Wow. Sella. Wow. Wow. Jay Talawa, do you want to... Yeah. Uh, I want to challenge everyone that's listening mm -hmm. to recognize that you are a creative, whether or not you formally do poetry or any art form, you are a creative. And recognize the power of your light. Every person has the ability to transform not only their lives, but the lives of everyone around them. And if it starts with you, it starts with you. Can you just add a one verse of a poem? Sure. Seven, Seven beards. Years. As the wars in the east, middleman wants to ascend through centuries of constructs to control their own destiny. You could have fooled me. Children of Negus must rise, shall rise, and build pyramids again in strange lands by rivers and seas and lakes under earthquakes of Babylon. For the more things change, and the more it stay the same. Rats chasing cats, cats chasing dogs, man running away from man, turn to the seventh chapter of Revelation. Give thanks. Give thanks. Give thanks. <laughs> Stop and consider this. Wow. Again, thank you all so much. Carolyn Thompson, Malachi Smith, Amina Blackwood Meeks, Javanil J. Talawa Trowers, thank you 
all of you for your insightful contributions um, to just this discussion and just for sharing not just your expertise in your respective fields of art or, or study, but just yourself, you know, and how you personally have engaged with media and how you are still engaging it in, it, in that two-way street that Talawa had mentioned earlier. And thank you, all of you who took the time to listen. This is, again, the launch of Ink and Insights. And we are excited about how these conversations can grow, can expand. We are excited about where it will reach because with everything online, right, we are hoping we can contribute to this hidden curriculum that was raised earlier today and be a, a positive force in the world around us. I'm your host, Casey Garvey, and tune in and look out for our next edition. Thank you. <laughs>